The video introduces four Vancouver Ranger Maureen, who will serve as the narrator. She is dressed in an official park ranger uniform with an olive green button-up shirt and slightly darker green pants. Her shirt is adorned with two symmetrical pockets, and two gold pins. A large brimmed hat sits on top of her long blonde hair. Blurred in the foreground, various pelts are stacked on a barrel. In the background, there is a wall of leather and casements called bales, a large wheeled cart, more barrels, a hanging black bucket, and a desk. Throughout the video, various images and clips are shown to aid with visualization of presented topics. Each of these will be described briefly. Welcome to the first store. This was one of the first buildings built at the historic Fort Vancouver, which tells you just how important it is. This warehouse contained the Hudson Bay Company's most valuable resource, beaver pelts, which were trapped in the Pacific Northwest and eventually shipped off to Europe by way of the Columbia River. The first image in this series shows an angled view of the exterior of the first door. The rectangular two-story building is features arched double door entrances and top story windows, lit by the warm light of a sunset. The area around the building is illuminated by lanterns. Groups of visitors are walking around the field nearby, and one family is entering the closest doorway. The video then pans across an interior scene of the first door, showing two leather bales and four tall stacks of beaver pelts. The next image focuses on a single leather bale. The letters H, B, and C, standing for Hudson's Bay Company, and the numbers 44 and 8 can be seen labeled on its side. A single piece of twine is tied around its center. The video then pans around another interior store scene, first to pelts hanging from a white wall, then to a red wheelbarrow filled with more pelts, and finally to several stacks of beaver pelts on the ground. The third image is a simple black and white line illustration of two men preparing beaver pelts on top of a wooden table. The man wearing a wide brimmed hat is retrieving the fur from the beaver, and the other man is cleaning the newly cut pelts. Beside the table lies a stack of the finished furs. The fourth image shows a wooden coat rack attached to a bright green wall. A brown top hat with a white bow and two cats are hanging on the rack. The fifth image is a black and white illustration of a fur trading clerk holding up a large beaver pelt. He wears a traditional light blouse, a dark vest, and cravat. Shelves of books, blankets, and other goods are in the background. The sixth image pans across a historical poster of black and white illustrations that show the work put into making beaver pelts. Across the page, there are illustrations of beaver pelt processing machines, fur trade workers, beaver hats, and hat models. The video then transitions to a clip of a beaver holding a stick in shallow water. It has a peanut-shaped body, round ears, a bear-like snout, and streaky brown fur. It dips the stick up and down and creates ripples in its murky habitat. The bank in the background is sandy and scattered with driftwood. Historically, this entire two-story building would have been filled wall-to-wall -wall with animal pelts. Today, we have about 500 on display to give you a sense of what it would have looked like in the past. In 1843, which was near the peak of the fur trade in this area, the Hudson's Bay Company shipped over 60,000 pelts of different kinds from Fort Vancouver to England. About one third of these would have been the most desirable beaver pelt, and that shipment would have been worth millions of dollars in today's money. The reason beaver pelts were so valuable was because of a fashion trend that was popular for over 300 years in Europe. People would pay a huge amount of money to put a beaver on their head, in the form of a hat, of course. Beaver was so valuable at the time, it was nicknamed soft gold. You could have become incredibly wealthy if you were one of the investors in the fur trade industry. Although the style of the beaver felt had changed often throughout this 300 year time period, the felt stayed the same. Felt made from beaver fur was not only soft, but also made a very durable and water repellent hat which made it the most sought after among all of the furry animals. This put tremendous strain on the beaver population and almost led to their extinction. It is hard for us to relate to the fashion trend of the beaver felt hat today, but it is important to understand that in Europe during this time period, what you wore on your head helped define who you were. These hats were a status symbol, which meant if someone saw you wearing a beaver felt hat, they would think that you were a wealthy or a powerful figure. 
This would set you apart from other people, much in the way that a luxurious sports car or valuable jewelry may today. It is important to know how big the Columbia Department territory was. The first image in this series is an illustration of the fort during its time of trade. In the foreground, a group of three Native Americans, wearing tribal robes and feathers, can be seen sitting on a muted field of grass. Further back, there are more clusters of people and a gated pasture, wooden buildings, and the fort's palisade. Large fir trees also are drawn in the background. The second image shows an angled view of the fort bastion, the wooden walk tower designed to protect the fort, at a corner of the palisade walls. Its tall rectangular base is topped with an octagonal second floor. In the background, a bright blue sky, a green field, and a few trees add color to the scene. The third image is used to illustrate the fort's bustle during the height of the fur trade. The drawing showcases the fort's many buildings, grand palisade, orchard and garden. The viewpoint of the illustration, like a bird's eye view at a distance, allows the scene to encompass a large area on the north bank of the Columbia River, including a group of houses in the village, the river, a sailing trading vessel, and a forest that expands just beyond the fort. The video then switches to a close-up of a field of wheat stalks swaying softly in the wind. Its yellow and green colors complement the blues of the clouded sky. It reached from the Rocky Mountains to the Hawaiian Islands and from Alaska into California. At the height of the fur trade, Fort Vancouver oversaw two dozen smaller forts, six ships, and over 600 employees. Also, for many early settlers, Fort Vancouver was the last stop on the Oregon Trail. Settlers could get supplies like seeds and tools for starting their new farms. Many of these forts helped establish cities that we know today. Fort Vancouver, of course, became Vancouver, Washington. Fort George became Astoria, Oregon. Fort Nisqually became Tacoma, Washington. And Fort Victoria became Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. An illustration of two trappers is shown first in this series of images about fur trapping. The trapper facing away from the viewer is dressed in an outfit that includes a hat, pants and an oversized jacket, all in the same color of blue, with red and yellow flourishes. He wears a red and blue belt that holds a hatchet and a sheathed knife, and carries a beaded satchel. His right hand is stretched out to the side in an effort to communicate something to the second trapper. The second trapper is wearing a similar belt, hat, satchel and trousers but in addition has a white jacket, a striped cravat, and a collection of furs draped over a beaded strap. The background is white. The second image shows a black and white illustration of two men drying beaver skins. One man is stretching the beaver skins over a bent circular frame, and the other is hanging stretched pelts on a wooden clothesline like contraction. A pile of other pelts and a stack of bent poles sit next to the first man. Leaning against a leafless tree, a stretched beaver pelt waits to be hung. The third image is another black and white illustration this time of a man in heavy buckskin clothing and a cap leaning over to set up an animal trap in still water. The trap looks similar to a modern-day bear trap, only smaller. The fourth image features a Native American man with long black hair and a cape. He is looking carefully at a raffle. The fifth image shows a man standing at the bow of a canoe attempting to spear some type of animal in the water. His spear is long and forks at the end into two sharp points. Behind the man, more people can be seen sitting inside of the boat. The sixth image displays a color illustration of Native Americans and trappers gathered outside of the fort. Dozens of furs are on the green grass in front of them. The people in this scene are either sitting, standing, or conversing with each other. In the background, a boat, a horse, a river, a forest and a large hill can be seen. Near the fort's entrance, the Hudson's Bay Company's red flag flies from a tall pole. Fort Vancouver employed trappers, who traveled throughout the Pacific Northwest in large groups. While the male employees were trapping animals, their families would keep camp, repair clothing, and prepare furs for storage. These brigades of employees were often away from the fort for most of the year, on foot, on horseback, or in boats, following water routes used by fur-bearing animals. There were also men called free traders, often members of local Native American tribes, who were not employees, 
but brought furs directly to Fort Vancouver to trade. In return for furs, employees would receive a salary that they could use at the company store. Free traders exchanged their furs for items such as blankets, guns, tobacco, beads, tools, and more. Although the fur trade was an economic opportunity for many, it also had horrible consequences. The fur trade opened up new areas of North America to settlement by Americans and Canadians. Native peoples were often forced from their homelands, exposed to new diseases, and struggled to keep their languages and cultural traditions. Of course, the fur trade also had a bad effect on animal species and ecosystems, especially in the Pacific Northwest, where the Hudson's Bay Company was competing with American fur companies. A large beaver with its eyes closed is shown floating in murky water. In its long fingered and black hands, it holds a thin branch from a lightly leafed plant. It possesses a round body, triangular ears, long whiskers, and brown fur. Next, a simple black and white line illustration is shown demonstrating how a beaver trap works. The drawing shows a beaver standing on its hind legs reaching for a treat that is suspended by a branch. Adjacent to the beaver lies the trap. Attached to the trap is a chain that prevents an ensnared beaver from escaping. The third and fourth images are more black and white illustrations but are focused on a man with short dark hair and heavy buckskin clothes. In one image, he is shown cutting open a dead beaver's stomach to retrieve its pelt. In the second, he is shown scraping the retrieved pelt clean. It is now flat. The next image is a photograph of a young boy dressed in a white blouse and green pattern scarf. He is shown holding up a long, thin, and bright orange fox pelt. In the background, a hanging black bucket and a wall lined with bales of pelts can be seen. They each tried to trap as many animals as they could to leave none for the others. This area became a fur desert because so many animals had disappeared. Eventually, the fur trade died out here. It was no longer profitable because too many animals had been killed. In addition, fashion trends in Europe changed again. A black and white illustration of Prince Albert is shown. He is sitting next to a table. Prince Albert wears pinstriped trousers, a light-colored vest, a black blazer and a cravat. He has curly hair, mutton chops, and a manicured mustache. A large column and a distant grove of trees can be seen in the background. The second photograph shows an elevated view of the fort's garden. Neatly cut bushes, shrubs, and colorful flowers fill the carved-out plots. A concrete walkway separates the plots and gives visitors a path to view the garden. Two empty, pyramid-shaped trellises protrude from the plots closest to the viewer. In the background, a green field and the fort's palisade can be seen. The third image focuses on a man looking inside of a candle lantern. He is inside the fort's store. With one hand, he holds the lid to the lantern open and with the other he holds a non-lit candle. The man wears a green cap, a white blouse, and a gray sweater. An assortment of items, including a pair of shoes, a book, and a powder horn sit on the wooden table in front of him. In the background, there is a wall of shelves filled with cloth, string, and various other home goods. In the 1850s, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, was seen wearing a silk top hat while making a speech. The demand for beaver felt hats dropped as they went out of style, and everyone wanted silk hats instead. Because of this, the Hudson's Bay Company turned their attention to other activities, such as farming and establishing stores that sold home goods. The history of the fur trade is important because it changed the Pacific Northwest forever. It was an industry that caused people to migrate great distances, supported trading across the globe, but it also ruined natural ecosystems. The consumers, the people in Europe who bought the beaver felt hats, were the driving force behind all of these changes. As we learn about the history of the fur trade, it is important to think about how the actions we take today in choosing our clothing, our food, or even our electronics may be affecting people and resources elsewhere in the world.